Before I begin the sermon, uh, just a quick note. I, those of you who are in my Bible classes here in the auditorium, you know very well that my, uh, my hearing is not always the best. I have tinnitus in both ears, and sometimes it takes me a minute when I hear something my brain has to try to process through and figure out what I've said, what I've heard. In, in Brother Greg's prayer tonight, uh, he prayed that, that our worship is acceptable in God's sight, and the first thing my ears heard was successful, and I thought, you know, in order for our worship to be successful, it has to be acceptable in God's sight. I think that's a good point, but, but as he prayed that, I had to uh, think through, it's not him, that's my hearing, uh, but it's an interesting point, and I think one that's worth keeping on our mind to have successful worship. Let's have it acceptable in the sight of God. About a year ago, uh, up in Nebraska, a man called 911 while he was driving, and he called because somebody was driving on the wrong side of the road on a divided highway. In fact, the other person, he said, nearly ran him completely off the road. When sheriff's deputies came trying to figure out what was going on, they, they found the man who they thought made the call. They asked him the question. They said, are you the one who called in? And, and the man said, yes. And the deputy said to the man, turns out it was you. Uh, he thought somebody else was driving the wrong way on the highway. He was the one driving the wrong way on that highway. He thought everybody else had it wrong. He did not examine himself the way he should have. You know, that's a thought that you and I need in our life, that we need to examine ourselves. The fact of the matter is that as we study the Scriptures, we find that, that what the Bible tells me to do, what it tells you to do, is to take that long, hard look at ourselves, to see who we are, to see if we are walking as Christ would have us to walk, as the Scriptures teach us. And sometimes we think about that. How do I do that? How can I examine myself? How can I look at my life to see if it's right in the sight of God? And as we open our Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 through 27, we get an answer to that question. Sometime back I was working on a sermon about making decisions, and, and as I worked on that sermon I took this text, and, and it was the introduction to the sermon. But I liked that introduction so much that, that I kind of lifted it and, and expanded it and turned that introduction into its own sermon because this is worth our full attention, not just to guide our thoughts into thinking about what are our decisions. How do we examine ourselves? How do we look at ourselves to see if we are right in the sight of God? And Solomon gives us several points to examine. Number one, he says what we need to do is to check our heart. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of of life. The New King James Version says, out of it spring the issues of life. And as we read these words, as Solomon says, keep your heart, the word keep means to guard, to protect, protect your heart. He's talking about not the physical blood pump, but that spiritual part of us that thinks, that feels, that has emotion, that, that will be somewhere for eternity. Guard your heart. Keep your heart. But what happens when we don't do it? If our heart is not right in the sight of God, and to answer that question, we get a picture in the book of Malachi. In particularly Malachi chapter 1, there the prophet is bringing God's message to the people of Judah. Now this was Judah after they had returned from Babylonian captivity. And they had learned their lesson about idolatry. They never went back to worshiping idols. But there was still a bit of a problem. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 8, God through His prophet said to the people, When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he accept this from your hand or accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts. God is, is asking the people. He's saying, I want you to think about this. Examine yourselves. 
These things that you're bringing me as an offering, instead of bringing the best of your flock to say, we're giving this to you, God, you're keeping those for yourself. You're holding on to those so you can sell them and get the best possible price in the market. And God said, you're bringing me your leftovers. You're bringing me whatever it is that, that you don't particularly want, you don't particularly need. God said, you're bringing that to me. You try that with your civic leaders. And let me know how that works out for you. That's what God is saying to His people. But now notice verse 13. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen and the lame and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. God said you sneer at it. You're looking at the worship and you say, what a, a weariness, how terrible that we've got to come before God and worship Him in these ways. That was the problem. Their hearts had drifted away from God. They needed to check their heart. So how do we do that? T today, how can you and I check our heart? W what can we do even more than check our heart, to get our heart where it needs to be for our heart to really be right with God. Where do we go? Well, number one, get to know God through His Word. Psalm 119, verse 11, we read, Your Word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. We need to open the pages of God's Word where He has revealed Himself. One of the problems we find for ourselves is Sometimes we'll sort of create the image in our mind of who we think God is or, or who we would want Him to be. And we'll say something like, well, I don't think God would have a problem if I whatever. Or, or I think God would like it if I did this. But we're basing it on what we think, what we like, what we would prefer. And what we learn in the Scriptures is we need to get to know God through His Word. He has told us who He is. He has shown us what He approves and what He doesn't. So let's get to know God through His Word. And in so doing, we should grow a greater love for God. Matthew 22 and verse 37, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. When we look to God and we see what our Heavenly Father has done, how that all of human history was to bring Christ into the world so that we can be saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, by His blood that was shed on the cross. How can we not grow in our love for God? And by the way, the next part of this goes along with it. Approach the Father through Jesus. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus made the statement, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so if we're going to come to the Father, if we're going to approach God, we have to come through Jesus by His blood, being cleansed of His blood as we're buried with Him in baptism so that we become His people. The message we find in the Bible, we approach our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. And then, if we want to have a heart right with God, give every part of your life to God. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, Peter tells us, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Humble yourself. We give ourselves to do His will. That's what we're doing. It's time for us to check our heart. It's time for us to get our heart right with God. That's the first thing we need to do. If we're, we're going to take that step of self-examination, if we're going to see where we are in God's sight, it begins with that spiritual part of us. Check your heart. But then number two, Solomon goes on to tell us also it's time for us to check our speech. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 24, Solomon says, put away from you a, a deceitful mouth and, and put perverse lips far from you. The, the word deceitful means crooked turned the wrong way, or as it's translated, deceitful. The word for perverse means crooked, just like the other one. This one means having gone wrong. Two different words Solomon uses to say you make sure your speech isn't wrong, that it's not twisted in, in God's sight. Well, we need to make sure that our words are right with Him. In Ephesians 4 and verse 29, Paul writing said, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but 
what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Let's use our words to edify. Uh, let's use our words to, to build up, not to discourage. In the Old Testament, in Numbers chapters 13 and 14, we read about what happened when Moses had sent 12 spies to look over the promised land, to, to go out and, and, and look at the land, talk about how bountiful the land was, and, and to come back. And, and of those 12 spies who were sent out, 10 came back and said, we can't do it. Two said we can, Joshua and Caleb. But, but 10 of those 12 spies came back and said, the armies are too great. Their cities have great walls around them. We can't hope to, to go into this land. And what they did in that was that they brought the entire nation down. The people believed them. And they lost their faith that God would bring them into the land that God had said would be theirs. In fact, they were going to have to wait 40 years before they would go into that land that they could have gone to there in Numbers 13 and 14. But because they lost faith in God, they had to wait for the next generation. But I want you to notice how this is characterized in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 28. Later, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel. He's reminding them of the things that happened and what they had done. And here's what he said. He said, you said, where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. I pray it's never said of me and you that we're discouraging the hearts of our brethren. I pray that, that in our words and the things that we say that, that, that we're trying to use our words not to tear down, not to try to put somebody in their place, but, but instead to encourage, to build up, to, to edify one another. In Proverbs 21 and verse 23, we are told, whoever guards his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. And that's the message. We need to check our speech. What are we saying? What are the words that are coming out of our mouth? And then Solomon adds to that, it's time for us to check our vision. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 25, Solomon went on to say, let your eyes Look straight ahead. Let your eyelids look right before you. The, the picture here is maybe something you've experienced. If you've ever gone for a walk in a, in a heavily wooded area that, that doesn't have a trail, and you knew you needed to go in a certain direction, but, but there are obstacles everywhere, and the only way to go in that one direction is to pick out some object in that one direction you want to go, keep your eyes on it, and no matter what happens around you, keep your eyes on that goal so that you can keep going toward it. If, if we don't know the area, that's the only way to make sure we're going in the right direction. Well, that's this concept that Solomon is giving to us. Keep your eyes straight ahead straight ahead. Make sure that you are focused on the goal of your life, of following God, of being His people. We know that there's a particular problem with our eyes. Solomon did have something to say about that. Proverbs 6 and verse 25. Now Solomon was writing here to his son. He wanted to give his son a warning about Someone he calls the immoral woman. It's not one particular woman. It, it's, it's an immoral woman. Ladies, the, the same thing is true of an immoral man. Keep that in mind. Proverbs 6 verse 25. Solomon said, Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. He's saying, Don't let what you're seeing take away from what you should understand about their character about who they really are. Don't let someone draw you away with a visual when it's not who they really are. They're not beautiful in the sight of God. We might think about what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 28 when He tells men, do not look on a woman to lust after her. Again, the same thing is true with women, but historically I think this has been a greater problem 
for men. However, sociologists tell us over the last two decades, women have been trying to catch up in this area. Sad to say, we live in a time where what we see is a problem for men and women alike. There are images that do tend toward immorality. And we need to keep in mind that those things are there and we can't allow those things to fill our vision. That's not the direction we ought to be going. Someone says, oh, if I see that, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't hurt me. It's going to affect our direction if we keep that in front of us. But you know, it's not just that. Over the last 10 to 12 years, maybe a little bit longer, there has been a special push in all sorts of media back when print media was big, but now in electronic media, of images that tend toward what's called body dysmorphia. Especially our young ladies get this picture in their mind of what they're supposed to look like from the fashion photo shoots. And they see these things that used to be in magazines, but now it's, it's on social media. It's everywhere you turn around. It's on television. It's in movies. And, and we have young ladies doing terrible harm to themselves trying to, to fit the bill of what they're seeing there because it's put the wrong concept of who they are in front of them. I'm all for being, being healthy. We, we ought to take care of ourselves, but, but don't be drawn aside by, by images that are going to cause somebody to, to go to some drastic means to, to try to look a certain way to, to fit the bill. And, and it's not just young ladies who, who are dealing with that. Young men are too, but maybe on that side, the young ladies are dealing with it on, on a little bit heavier level like the young men on the other side. I read a quote years ago and... To just read the quote today would, would be dated. I'm going to adjust the quote. It was from a sociologist. But, but to bring it up to date, she would have said, if you thought Sesame Street, Paw Patrol, and Blue's Clues taught your four-year-old something, then you should know that YouTube, Instagram, and Snapchat are teaching your 14-year-old something. And it's true. We ought to keep an eye on that and have an open dialogue with our young people to, to know what they're seeing, what's coming into their mind, so that we can talk about it and talk about what's real and what isn't real and what's important and what isn't important so that they understand serving God is more important than, than the lengths that some will go to try to look like that, that image or, or to chase after that, that concept that's put in front of them. It's time for us to have a checkup. We need to examine ourselves. And Solomon says, when you have this checkup, it's time to check your vision. And then he says, furthermore, it's time to check your direction. Proverbs chapter 4, beginning with verse 26, Solomon says, ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or, or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. It's a point of real biblical wisdom to look at something and ask the question, in what direction will this decision take me? If I make this particular choice, will it cause me to be closer to Jesus, walking in Him, or will it cause me to go farther and farther away from Him? And we're going to have to be honest with ourselves when we ask that question. Ponder the path of your feet. Which way are you headed? Where are we getting our information about how to live? How to serve God. What life should be. Are we looking to the Bible? Are we looking to the inspired Word of God to, to see what the Scriptures say? Are we turning to the Christians around us? People who have lived in Christ for years, decades, who have been following Jesus, walking more closely with Him every day. People who do look to the Bible, who have shown it by the way that they live. Do we turn to them for our advice to tell us which way to go or... Have we decided we're going to look everywhere else? We need to be careful. In Proverbs 4, beginning with verse 14, we read, Do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. 
be careful of your direction. Proverbs 13 verse 20 adds to it, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Too many times we're enamored by the world, or maybe not the world, maybe it's some religious teacher who has some truth, but there's a good bit of error packed in with that truth that they have. And, and if we don't have the grounding in the Word of God to know right from wrong, good from bad, we may find ourselves taking in things that ultimately lead us astray, that turn us from following our Lord Jesus Christ. The direction that we're going matters to God. We need to take a look uh, that self-examination. It's time for us to check our direction. Here in Proverbs chapter 4, Solomon gives us these four different areas of life. He's showing us how important it is to have a checkup, to take that time of self-reflection, of self-examination. We might call it preventive maintenance. To, to look at ourselves and say, where am I in this? Have I gotten off track? Check your heart. Check your speech, check your vision, check your direction. Which way are we going? It's what we all need to do. And maybe as you hear these words, you're thinking, you know, I, I'm listening to this and, you know, maybe I didn't do so well in the checkup. I, I'm listening to this and there's an area there where I've, I've gotten a little bit off track. Maybe I look at it, there's more than one area where I've gotten off track. Well, if that's the case, it, it's a problem. But it's a problem that you can correct. It's a problem that you can make right. How do you do it? It starts with Jesus. Be cleansed from your sin by His blood. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, then, then come to Him. He came to this earth and He went to the cross and shed His blood on the cross to take away my sin and yours. And He has shown us how to come to Him. That hearing the Word, we believe. That we repent of our sin and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And, and then we're buried with Jesus in baptism for the remission of our sins. Our sins are washed away. We become Christians. We become the Lord's people. That's how you come to Him. Now if you've done that, but somewhere along the way you've gotten off track and, and you're not walking in that one direction toward Christ, you, you've kind of turned to the side and and come home. He's waiting for you to come. Repent of your sin. Confess it to Him. He will forgive you. Be cleansed of your sin. And when you do that, then make that rock solid commitment to do what's right. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 14, Paul puts it this way. Romans 13 and 14, he says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. What a picture that is. Put on Christ. Start following Him. If you've wandered from Him, come home. Follow Him again. Put on Christ. And you make that commitment that I'm not leaving the door open to sin. I'm not making a provision for the flesh to keep sin in my life. Are you ready to do that? If the checkup didn't go so well, come to the Lord. Be buried with Him in baptism. If you've done that, but as a Christian you haven't been faithful, come home. If as a child of God, you recognize the struggles of your life. As a Christian, you know the temptations that come before you and, and those things that, that you're fighting against daily and, and you're doing okay with it, but you know it's going to hit you again. And you need the, the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can come and, and seek those prayers. We'll pray with you and for you right now so that together we'll walk in the Lord. Won't you come to Him as we stand and as we sing? Hear us before.